Hi everyone, just note we are now live on YouTube, but we officially start at six. Hi Zama. Hi Tawela, how are you? How's everyone today? Good, good. How are you? <sighs> good, good. Thanks. Um, just a long day, but really excited for tonight. I can't see your mouth, Zama. Just and now? Because... Yes, now I can. Right, you've, got a new, okay. you've got a new hairstyle. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thanks for noticing. Really? Yeah. What did I have the other day? Not that. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, you know, um, Naveen, I must tell you, it's the beauty of being black, hey? Like, no, you can I have know. five different hairstyles in one day, I swear. I, I know that. I know that well. You should try it. You should try it. Come join us. <laughs> no, but I've also realized with black women, um, because you guys get to change your hair so often, 99 yes. times out of 100, if I meet somebody and I say, oh, hello, and I introduce mm. myself because I think I've never met them before, and then they look very offended because I should remember yes. this. 99 times out of 100, it gets me out of trouble by saying, but you've changed your hair. Ah! <laughs> you've always changed your hair, so it works. <laughs> That's a good one. My microphone has changed. Can you guys still hear me? I can hear you. Yes. All right. Good stuff. We will start yeah. at exactly six. Is my whole okay. yes. She is supposed to be joining us. Um, right. We've sent her messages, but it looks like she's running late. Okay. So yeah. we, will, we will start at six. And then I ended up using Mentimeter. Ah, um, no, I. I figured out you can use a plugin. So I, after weeks of being driven crazy, I tried Slido and then they said you just use a plugin. And I thought, well, maybe Mentimeter's got a plugin. And it does. Yeah. So hallelujah. And the plugin works beautifully. So I figured, you know what? Let me just use that. So that's what we'll be using mm -hmm. today. Um, and people actually hear and see us right now. Sorry. Yeah, we're on YouTube. Yay. Hi, YouTube oh, people. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> let's see who has oh we've already got 14 participants let's see who's in there yeah. hello tambi charlene busi ursula michelle we see you hello okay i think i will start so welcome to ordinary extraordinary um, my name is Tawela Mukosa. I will be your host for the Women's Month series. Today, I'm joined by some lovely ladies. And my co-host is Mafuze Tobo. She is currently working at Discovery. She is um, an experienced management consultant. She's an avid baker. And in her spare time, she also creates amateur documentaries and she loves to slow hike. Hi, Zama. Hi, hi, Toela. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to tonight. No, thanks, Zama. Zama, can you kindly take us through some of the housekeeping for tonight? Okay, perfect. Let's get right into it. So, um, guys, it's so awesome to be here. Really looking forward to this. I think a lot of preparation has gone into it. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, who corporate politics? Well, you'll hear all about it just now. So just um, a quick one. Of course, I'm sure you guys know this is a webinar. Um, so I think it might be best for everyone perhaps to um, use the comment section to send in your questions. We invite as many questions and comments as possible. We will throughout the conversation be referring to them, reading them out. Um, and really, I think the purpose of, of what Toela and I will be doing here is just to be a channel of communication for you guys. Uh, we're not here to actually own the conversation. The conversation is yours. So I think the big ask here is perhaps let's all come with very curious minds and open hearts um, and really immerse ourselves um, um, in this conversation. We've got some fantastic guests tonight, um, really some world-class people. Um, so I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, 
Yeah. Thanks for that, Zama. Um, just to just remind some of you who are our first time guests, the intent of the webinar. So the webinar was created as a platform where we get to speak to, to leaders in our network that can come and share their stories on specific topics that can actually help you pivot in your careers. Um, and, and, and it's just so that you can get some nuggets that you can actually go back and practically implement and get some inspiration just to keep you going. Um, just mm -hmm. a bit of, of, of um, another, some more housekeeping. We're live on YouTube. We've got a Facebook page, um, Ordinary Extraordinary. Please go there and like. As uh, Zamafuze said, please, we would like engagement. Would love you to keep that chat room popping. Um, any questions you've got, put them in the Q&A. We've got a poll running now. If you could kindly just go to and use the poll to one one zero eight and and just take part in that poll. Um, as you know, today's topic is how to successfully navigate corporate politics. A topic that is so relevant today, yet um, avoided like the plague to be talked about, yet it's something that is being done every day in each and every com um, organization. And we've got some phenomenal ladies here today. Uh, Zama, maybe if you could just introduce your first, our first panelist. Perfect. Yeah, our first panelist, um, I'm actually very excited to introduce her because um, in actual fact, once I really got to know what she was about, um, um, I really started to dig deep uh, in, into some of her work and better understand what, what informs it. Um, she joins us with a prolific career um, across multiple industries and sectors. I think she's probably spent the, 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 the better half of her career, I guess, as an executive leader and a CEO of multiple organizations like the Business Women's Association and Nurturing Orphans of AIDS for Humanity. Um, today, she's actually MD of Naven Post Postma. Um, and of course, this gives you a hint as to who we're talking about. In the past, um, she worked uh, for the South African Reserve Bank um, and also um, for Standard Bank um, as the head of leadership and culture uh, for the group. Um, so she comes with vast experience and I think even better um, is about to actually launch a really uh, phenomenal book, uh, which we'll also try to get uh, you know, a bit into, uh, and hopefully it will guide some of the insights um, that we'll be able to share and, and that she'll share with, with everyone. Um, of course, our guest is none other than Naveen Post Postma. Please welcome her, everyone. Um, Naveen, thank, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Our next panelist is Bushle Moyo. Uh, Bushle Moyo is a career chef at Career Grow. Um, which she started 11 years ago. She's got 19 years of experience in human resources and people development. Absolutely, absolutely love Bushle. Um, this Bushle describes herself as God's special work in progress, an unyielding people developer, nurturer, and is suitably qualified um, for people leadership. Um, I just want to quote something that Bushle often says. She says, and I quote, as long as I'm alive and have strength for the day, I'm determined to inspire and have a positive impact on those who trust me with their careers. She's married, she's been married for 23 years, and she's a mom of three beautiful girls. Hello, Bushle, and thank you so much and welcome. Thank you for having me, Toela, and um, I'm looking forward to this. Oh, thank you, Bushle. So I think let's just get into it. So the poll is running and mm -hmm. we've asked the attendees, um, in one word, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think corporate politics? Um, so maybe I would like to start off with Niven. What's your definition of, of corporate politics, just to get the conversation going? Yeah, thanks, Tuela. So it's fabulous watching the word cloud form because 
the definitions that people are using, mm. with the exception of one person who says exciting, <laughs> are all incredible well, and opportunity, you know, this, that's maybe neutral, but they're all incredibly negative, incredibly mm. unpleasant. And actually, this idea of politics is only being negative, is only being at the expense of other people, is, is the prevalent definition of, of this politics. Politics, by definition, are negative, unpleasant, horrible, unethical. And actually, that's not the definition of politics. That is a version of office politics. But the actual mm. definition of office politics is that they are about the informal, unofficial, sometimes behind the scenes ways that all organizations work and all people mm. engage it's done. to sell ideas, to increase their power, or pretty much to get anything done. So informal, unofficial, behind the scenes ways of making things happen is a completely neutral definition. And that is the definition. And so if the definition is neutral, of course, you can get bad politics, which are the words that we've seen up on the screen. Mm. But by definition, you can also get good politics. And that's part of what I really enjoy opening people's minds to, that politics is a multifaceted way of showing up in organizations. It's not only negative. Mm. Love that. Um, just before we go further, maybe Zama, would you like to introduce Mahola? I see Mahola. Oh, there. Mahola has joined us. Oh, fantastic. Welcome, Mahola. Um, better late than never. It's so fantastic to have you here with us. Uh, Mahola is a Tutu fellow, actually, which is pretty awesome. Um, she comes with lots of experience experience having worked um, across the, the energy sector in operations, in, in policy formulation and regulation. Um, today, she is actually the deputy director for energy in the Department of Public Enterprises. Um, and I think what's really fantastic about having Mahola uh, on with us um, is she can actually offer a, I guess, a lot of insight into how the public sector um, uh, environment actually looks like and how things work there, right? Um, and we all know that, you know, in whichever sector you may be, there's, there's a game to play, right? Um, so it's going to be interesting to hear the perspective from that side, especially at the at the senior level that she works in. Um, so we look forward to that. Mahola, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we hope that uh, you're going to really um, enjoy engaging with everyone on, on this topic. Thank you, Zama, and thank you for having me. Thanks. Um, Bushle, what is your definition of corporate politics? When I, when I thought to define it, I actually couldn't find a phrase that would capture it in a, in a simple way. So the way that I would define it is I'll just use different words um, that I have come across being in, in corporate South Africa. One of mm. those words, um, is definitely influence. Mm -hmm. uh, another of those words is the informal nature of politics, uh, of corporate politics. Another word is power. Uh, and another word is constituencies. Because everything that is happening informally is happening around a group, a group whether by position uh, whether by authority, whether by expertise, um, and it's really trying to influence how decisions in an organization are taken. And it's, it's generally viewed as giving advantage to one at the expense of another, and it, it isn't necessarily that. So I guess when we go deeper into the conversation, we will see just how do we use what most um, have experienced, I also have experienced as negative, to something mm. that can actually work for you. Mm. Mahola, perhaps you can also uh, uh, jump in on this um, and help us demystify, uh, you know, just your thoughts on corporate politics. 
Um, thank you, thank you, Zana. And and I think, like Niven said in the beginning, it's quite striking to see that some of the words that are coming up from from the audience, um, in mm. terms of the negative perception of corporate politics. But really, you know, my my impression is that corporate politics is about um, how we interact within an organization in pursuit of um, objectives for for an institution. How do we relate with each other? Where does the power lie? How do we exercise the power between ourselves? And I think more often than not, this perception of negativity because um, you know there's, there's there's individual person's interest inherently um, in all the interactions, and there tends to be winners and losers in some of the interactions, and that's why people um, perceive that as negative. And I think you know it would be quite interesting to to unpack the negative aspects of, of corporate politics because whether we like it or not, you know when when you walk into an organization on a day to day basis. Uh, basis and how you interact with colleagues, how you interact with your subordinates is, is, is part of the relationships and part of um, the existence of you as an individual, your colleagues and the institution um, itself, and how you find a way to be able to achieve your own objectives within, within that environment. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not all about negativity, but it's about the fact that corporate politics is a way of um, existence and interaction within you know, any, any one institution and yeah. So, so Tawela, actually, I think that the two statements in this word cloud before we just get into the conversation that uh, I'd like us to perhaps just look at. It's so interesting, the boys club and the, ooh, it's just moved. Uh, and, yeah, and blesses. No, and blesses. Okay. So, yeah. Wow. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually wondering, and perhaps let's, Let's hear more. Um, I don't know if anybody's actually thought about the blesser part, um, but I think in my head I'm already making inferences and creating a story around perhaps where that might be coming from. But I think it's also somewhat very linked to this boys' club preference that's been referred to here. Um, perhaps uh, any 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 uh, of you are on the panel, just your thoughts around the boys' club. Uh, concept, especially because you know we are in Women's Month and we have a nice all women panel. It should be interesting to actually hear, I guess, what are our thoughts on this boys' club preference and what exactly does that look like? And perhaps if you have an experience uh, that you can share or a story around that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, so I'll, I'll kick off. Look, I, I completely agree with what Bukle and Makula are saying, and just to amplify. I mean, firstly, absolutely. The fact that it's informal, that office politics are informal, and the fact that there's an yeah. idea that some people benefit and everyone else doesn't mm. is part of what I think gives rise to these words yeah. and part of what gives mm. rise to this phrase, a boys club. Because there is the sense that it's unfair because the written rules and the informal things that are going on are not the same thing. And I don't know what the informal stuff is if I'm not part of the inside group that does know if I'm not part yeah. of the witness that get to take it all. And so I think the us and them that, that start to take shape in office politics, those who feel that they're on the inside or those who feel that they're on the outside, absolutely breaks down in a whole bunch of ways. So it can break down along race lines. It can break down mm. along the line. You know, especially if you think about the context of South Africa, who holds the power in many organizations? And so this idea of an us and them, like I say, can mm. absolutely cleave along race and gender lines. But in my experience, it's a lot bigger than just race and gender. And, you know, you can be an other in a group for multiple reasons. Race and gender are, are real reasons why you can be an other and they're inescapable. But they are not the only reasons. And, and certainly in my experience, um, a couple of things. Some of the best feminists I've ever met have been men. And sometimes this idea that there is a boys club or a queen mm. or, or something external to ourselves that's keeping us back is a really good excuse and a really bad reason. Hear me carefully and clearly. I am not saying that that doesn't exist, but that that is the only and single answer and the only and single definition of office politics, I think too often is a cop-out. And so instead of looking at the opportunity, which is the one word that somebody used, in politics, instead of looking at the things that Buchle spoke about, 
your relationships, your power, your influence, the perceptions that people have of you and how you can build them. I think sadly, too many people's minds shut down and say, it's a boys club by definition, I can't access it. I don't play golf, I don't mountain bike, I don't watch soccer, I didn't go to whatever school. And so they just shut down to the possibility and the opportunities without actually taking the time and the effort to see where they might play in this space, how they might play ethically, and that there are in fact more opportunities than you realize if you engage actively in the space. So if I just add on that, um, the, the word patriarchy for me is probably the biggest one here. Mm -hmm. And my experience is that it has come from the systemic structure of organizations that it has been men who for as long as we've been, who have been running organizations. So when it's patriarchy, it's already looking like it's just those five boys and whoever they bring into their inner circle. And that seems unbreakable. Mm -hmm. My experience also is, as Devane has mentioned, that then you shut down. An alternative could very well be to understand firstly, your own power in that organization. A lot of people forget that when they were hired into the organization, there is something that the organization identified as valuable. So when you are looking at the office politics, you forget your own value and you start to just be wanting to run in the office politics without um, understanding or just forgetting your value. The second thing that for me, uh, a lot of people have also missed that you look at this boys club as a collective and you don't understand the different power bases of each of the individuals in the boys club, if you're calling it a boys club. And that's also important. It's a lot of work when I, when I think how can any professional do this at the workplace, because it, you can just be running around office politics, but it's important that you understand when you're calling it a boys club, in that club, what is the power of each one of them? Is it authority? Is it expertise? Is it the financial director because he signs the checks? Uh, and interestingly, um, executive PAs to CEOs and CFOs are also in the boys club, even though they are not boys. And their power generally is because they have access, they have direct access to power. So once you start to break it apart, then you can start to look at, well, what is my move and why would I want to move in that? I also want to say, it can work for you if you have the emotional muscle to go into this. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not a fist fight, it's not a words fight. It really is, do I, am I going to stand by my own voice? Am I going to shut up when I need to because I can recognize the minute I say something, I'm not going to keep my advantage. So it, it, it really is as a professional, build yourself up, study first what is happening in the organization before you start that game because it can end very badly. And on the other hand, you can actually use it as a way to pivot yourself mm -hmm. uh, in, in the organization. Absolutely. Yeah, I think ju just to add, add on that, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite interesting, the, you know, some of the key words that are, that are coming up here, so certainly didn't expect to see blessers, but I think, you know, <laughs> a big part of it is, is, is the per whole perception that, you know, the C-suit in most organizations more often than not um, is male and that, you know, for some women who try to interact at that, at that level, um, there tends to be a negative connotation uh, um, attached to it. You know, I, I think it's important that we need to emphasize that I, I emphasize the point that the reluctance to engage in, 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 in corporate politics does not make politics go away. You know, more often than not, you believe if you if you don't engage in areas where you need to engage, where you are required to interact, 
or you are required to influence and make your presence felt either as an expert or a professional in a particular space does not necessarily work in your favor that it's important and, and i think a good part of it comes from you know as i look at my earlier career a big part of it came from my academic training just that just didn't prepare me for um a corporate environment you know you come into a corporate space you've got technical expertise and you just want to have a technical um, solution that you apply to a problem. But more often than not, problems that um, that you find in corporate are, are, are what we would call wicked problems that require um, a set of, um, uh, um, you know, I, I would call it a set of, um, not just a technical solution, but some level of, 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 of business interaction with various stakeholders in a business for a technical solution to have a buy-in. And more often than not, professionals would get frustrated because you think, you know, this is an obvious technical solution that I hold that should be embraced by everybody. But because you don't understand the different interests and motivations that different people at various levels in the organization have, um, you are not able to identify what their interests, what the various people's interests would be in a particular solution. And you therefore get discouraged because, you know, at a very technical level, your, your solution looks looks quite um, obvious. So, I mean, I, I agree quite strongly with Bushe about the point of, you know, when you are a, um, a, a professional in a specific place, it's quite important that you strongly um, protect that space, that you interact um, and you don't, you know, you don't become reluctant about interacting on an issue just because you are sitting with a, a technical solution to a problem. You need to be able to study your stakeholders. You need to be able to study the different interest groups and the interaction um, who stands to lose what in the decision that you are presenting on the table. And I think more often than not, we, we fail to recognize that when you present a specific aspect to an issue in an organization, there, there will be losers and, and, and winners from that. And, and that when you walk out of that boardroom, you probably may have offended one or two people. And how do you, you know, how do you deal with those fallouts um, um, from those conversations? And how do you move on? You know, and it requires some level of emotional maturity for you to be able to understand that, you know, not everything is personal. It's about the corporate itself and objectives that need to be um, attained and, and achieved. And that, you know, you need to be able to manage those fallouts and manage the relationships um, going forward. But I, I certainly would want to make a very strong point that the reluctance to engage in corporate politics does not serve as, um, as women more often than not. You need to be able to engage. Um, but you engage in such a way that you understand the space that you are trying to influence. You don't walk into an organization and get caught up in politics that don't really um, contribute to any one objective that you are hired to achieve or that you as an individual are trying to achieve from, from specific um, um, interactions or objectives that you may have been given. And I think it's important that as you talk about corporate politics, because it's quite easy to get sucked into walking into an organization, observe politi existing um, um, politics and want to interact in that space, that you need to be very careful about engaging in politics that really do not serve any one thing that you have been hired um, to achieve, that you need to engage in as far as, in as, far as um, the, the areas that are important for you and for, for, for what is required of you. If I can just... Um... So, 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 sorry, quick one. I, I think this is actually a fantastic segue to actually get into, I guess, because Mahola, you spoke about engaging and, and actually getting into the ring and, and, and starting to engage in the corporate politics. So there are a number of things that I think Tawila and I have picked up and the, and the rest of, um, of, of, of the guys listening in, right? There, there are about four things that I, you know, I, I've picked up in this conversation. The first, of course, was around the upper, the upper hand, uh, well, some people having the upper hand and then also there being underdogs. Um, so there's in and out groups that tend to happen, whether it's uh, by race or gender, et cetera. The second is around um, the value that one brings um, and that it's important to remember that, right? Um, the third is then, I guess, asking yourself, what value do those who are in the in-group actually bring? Um, and the fourth, which I actually also quite liked, uh, and it's something that I use quite a lot in my in, 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 in my career as well, is not to take things personally. And I'm sure people would have picked up lots of different things, but these were the things that kind of stood out for me. And I guess it brings us to, I think, a, a very good you know, uh, moment to now kind of reflect on some really practical stuff around 
I guess a lot of people are also asking this question. So how do I actually enter uh, corporate politics? How do I engage? Where do I start, right? How do I move myself from the out group into the in group? Where does one actually start when they think about that? Naveen? Yeah, so some thoughts, but I just want to close on this discussion before I answer your questions, Emma. I think the first thing for me is I'm glad that patriarchy is going down in prominence in the word cloud because, look, I've worked in male-dominated environments, I've worked in mixed environments, I've worked in female-dominated environments three times. And I always say I am not going to work in a female-dominated environment for a fourth time because this idea that politics is a male-female thing Okay, that has some merit. But in my personal experience, the most destructive, petty, vindictive politics, the yeah. truly bad politics happened in an all female environment, not just once, not just twice, but three times. So I'm not going into that environment again. People of all genders can show up in unpleasant ways. In my experience, when a group of women are dysfunctional and get into bad politics, it is particularly personal and unpleasant. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, and actually that also answers the second question, which is remove some of the filters that you think it only happens over there. And if you were in an all women environment, things would be magically okay. That's not the case. Second thing is, I think are we talking about corporate politics. I don't talk about corporate politics. I talk about office politics because you know it really doesn't matter. I've worked in NGOs. I've worked in the public sector at the Reserve Bank. I've worked in the corporate sector. I've worked in South Africa. I've worked overseas. I've worked in boardrooms. I've worked in communities. Politics happens everywhere. So it's office politics because it's the nature of human beings to engage in the informal, unofficial, and vie for power. And you have to when there are limited resources. If resources were unlimited, you wouldn't need more power to get things done because you could all get everything. And I think the third thing is absolutely to Mahola and Mukhle's points about the technical solution and what you bring. You asked for a story, so let me share one. Most of my um, career has been in strategy consulting. And my very first job was working for one of the big consulting firms. We had an 18 month project uh, for the South African government at a time when Nelson Mandela was still president. It was to come up with a 20 year strategy for a sector of the economy. 18 months of analysis with the best experts that could be brought in from all over the world to think strategically about what should happen and more importantly, what should not happen to make things work. All this analysis gets presented to cabinet. I was too junior to be in the room. This was over 20 years ago, but the head of the team came out afterwards and said to me, it went really well. And I said, well, that's fantastic. I can't wait to see this technical best solution, the objective answer that makes the most sense implemented. And he looked at me and he said, well, you know, Niven, of course, that the gap between the technical best strategy that we have just presented and what's actually going to happen, that's all about power and politics. And we don't have line of sight of that as strategy consultants, but that is what will determine what will actually happen here. And he was absolutely right because 90% of what we suggested didn't happen because of power and political interests that got satisfied at the expense of the objective best solution. So anybody like Buchle said, who focuses purely on the technical answer at the expense of the relational things that will make that answer happen or not happen is making a big mistake. So to answer your question, um, I think the first thing is to understand exactly the points that have been made and to really understand it that if you are not doing politics, politics will do you. And so this choice that you think you're making to opt out is a very short-sighted choice. The second thing is to understand that this idea that you can either be a good person, a decent ethical professional, or you can play politics is also a complete mistake. You can and you must do both, not only for your own sake, but for the sake of your team that needs you to fight a whole bunch of battles and get things done. Mm. And the third thing is, again, to reinforce the first point, you are part of this whether you like it or not. I was in Lagos a few years ago. They had a fantastic billboard as I was stuck in their horrendous traffic. And that billboard said, you're not in the traffic, you are the traffic. <laughs> it's exactly the same with politics. You are part of this. How do you show up on your terms in ways that benefit you, your team, your career, your organization, and what you're trying to do? 
as opposed to think you're going to escape it, you're not. I just want to add to what you've just said. The two, two words that keep popping up from all the panelists, and this is power and this is influence. Um, so now, what advice can you give us with regards to opting in? So opting out doesn't seem to be an option. We need to play the political game. So how can we play it ethically and well, or maybe let me rephrase it. How can we play good politics? Maybe well, I'll hand over to Bukhle and Mahola to answer and yeah. add okay. my bit so, on the thing. So my, my answer to, to playing good politics goes first to remember why you are there. You are not there to play the politics. You are there firstly to give value and to receive value. That is your agenda. You're giving value to the organization and you are receiving value. As you are busy with your agenda, there are other agendas that need to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. How do you attach to the agendas that make sense in the organization? My example, I didn't, I, I was one of those naive people and I call it privilege. I just carry on with my job and don't think too much about anything until somebody says, but um, so, I had to own the space that I was in. The agenda was transformation. The agenda was transformation in 2005, 2006, just when the codes were promulgated, it was a hot potato and somebody needed to own it. It was already political before I got there. So I landed in the politics not knowing. And my one decision was, if anyone is going to have anything to say, it's going to be positive. So the first thing that I did is I owned the space. If there was anything transformation related in that organization, I was part of that discussion. I didn't lose my voice because it would have suited others that this doesn't happen. So I didn't forget I was a professional. I owned my space. The, sec the third or fourth thing that I did is I made sure that the final decision maker in the organization that I worked for had line of sight in terms of what I was doing, in terms of what I was thinking, in terms of what was going to come up in the transformation space. So each time I had to talk transformation, that leader was standing right next to me. So in that way, I already demonstrated that, yes, the politics can be there, but guess who I've got in my camp? So suddenly I wasn't in the politics myself, but I had also brought in a key decision maker to stand with me in that politics. And that yeah. made it much easier. Hmm. And I still go back to the, to the thing, the good guys don't always get the recognition. Don't forget that. You do have to play hardball. You do have to have difficult conversations. You do have to walk up to people and say to them, I am not sure I understand where we are. Can you take me into your confidence and stand your ground? You, you, you can't let up on being professional because you are in the political game. You can't do that because that then is just a recipe for, for your own demise, if I can say it that way. Yeah, so I think my, my first point would be, and I think I see there's a lot of um, commentary about how do we enter corporate politics. Um, I don't think you play corporate politics the day you opt in. Um, by virtue of you being in an organization, you are part um, of corporate politics. It's whether you have opted to exercise the limited uh, or extensive power that you might have in an organization. So at any given point in time, you are part of a political, uh, of the politics of a corporate. You know, I, uh, one of my previous bosses used to say uh, to us that you must never leave power lying around. And, and how I understood that phrase, and for the longest of time, I didn't understand it because it was quite a, an aggressive personality. But how I understood that was, um, you know, after a long period of, of interaction with this, with, with this person was, 
leaving power lying around is allowing people to come into your space either as a you know as a professional or technical expertise and having a life say about what you have to offer without you having the confidence to either you know contextualize that or to be able to offer a different perspective about really what's going on in the organization and and what and what um what you have to 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 offer and i think you will earn a lot of respect in an organization once you find um, a way to craft that space um, around yourself and being very clear about, you know, Mufi makes this point around your value offering in an organization, because I think sometimes we talk about corporate politics because you want to have a broader say in what happens in an organization. Sometimes that is not your, your playing game. Your playing game is about what are you employed to do at that point in time and what's the best way to offer an organization um, uh, um, um, value and that's and, and that's where you're going to be able to 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 demonstrate your value to an organization not engaging in broader politics that may not necessarily be in line um, with what um, um, you have been uh, employed to offer so delivering value in terms of why you've been brought into an organization is what's going to offer um, um, respect in, in as far as you're standing in an organization and the integrity that you bring and part of um, you know, playing a role in, in, in organizational politics is having a voice about um, things that are, um, are right or wrong. You know, when you're invited into a boardroom, when you're invited into a meeting, you don't walk into a meeting because you are there to only look after your individual interests, but being able to have express a view um, about areas that may not um, um, necessarily be directly yours, but may, you may have a view in as far as the ethical lines and so forth are being, are being presented. And I always make the point that when you, you know, when you on your first day when you walk into an organization, you need to be able to draw the lines about, you know, what is it that you want to achieve out of, out of an organization, and what is it that you are prepared to pay as a price to achieve um, um, either upward mobility or whatever it is that you want to achieve out of an organization. Because you can get so sucked up um, in corporate politics that you, you, you know, at some point you lose yourself, and you need to be able to have very clearly defined triggers at a point in time that says beyond this prize, I'm no longer prepared um, to, to, you know, to interact in this organization. I'd rather sit it out. So it, it, it should never be, I want to be in corporate politics at all costs, but it should be around as an individual and my capabilities and what I can offer this institution, this is what I'm prepared to do. And beyond this line and beyond the interests of other people that may not be in line with what I'm prepared to do, I'm prepared to, to actually you know, walk away from that. And I, I think coming from a public sector, I could give you a billion <laughs> examples, but I think that- one example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'll, I'll think of a, a less controversial example um, later on to, to give you guys. But I think, you know, being able to draw those, those, those lines for yourself upfront is quite important because if you leave it to the heat of the moment, the lines get very blurry and, and you'll find yourself being the biggest loser in the corporate politics. So, I mean, there's some powerful stuff um, coming out of here. So some of the things that I'm hearing are just in terms of practical things, guys, is sponsorship and thinking clearly about getting the right sponsor, um, having high stake conversations, your personal branding and credibility when it comes to your technical expertise, confidence and being able to express your your well-informed views, um, are well uh, knowing your threshold and triggers. There's a lot of really amazing stuff that's coming out of here, I think, uh, just in terms of starting to think about practical things. And perhaps to get us into storytelling mode, I'm actually going to start off with a, a very, um, I'm going to share a very uh, a quick thing that I've found in my experience um, I had to learn the hard way. Um, so I have several times uh, been in a position where, you know, you walk into Exco or you walk into uh, a boardroom and there's an idea or thought that you're selling um, and somehow you were aligned with perhaps uh, um, one person in the room, right, in terms of selling this particular idea uh, and getting everybody in the room uh, motivated for it. Um, and then it fails. Because, hey, um, one person decides actually, no, maybe that's not going to work. And the rest of the chorus starts to sing in and everybody pokes holes in this idea that you're selling. And I've experienced this many times, right? Um, and I think uh, more recently, I'd say in the past couple of years, I've worked with a leader who, he's a man, um, but he knows how to play the game well. And he likes to say he plays the long game 
right? And, and, and he always, you know, tries to, to kind of um, um, say, you've got to have patience in this game. And one of the key things that I learned, um, I think, in working with, with this particular individual, and I guess it's a practical thing that I'd also like to share and hopefully invite now the panelists to actually share their practical, just how, how to do it. One of the key things that I learned was, you know, he, he, he always says, never walk into um, an exco room or boardroom without knowing what the final decision is going to be. And so his thing is always that um, before you walk in, you should know which way the room is going to go. So you need to have done your lobbying and all your work before you you go in there. This idea of walking in with a fantastic presentation and trusting that all your thoughts and ideas are already perfect on paper um, is very naive, right? And so one of the things I've had to learn very quickly is to actually spend um, a good amount of time, um, particularly that runway leading to that particular meeting, to spend that time doing round robins with every single person who's going to be in the room and perhaps also uh, a lot more time with people whom you know um, hold a lot more um, a lot more influence within that particular room um, and making sure that you already know which way they might actually sway uh, and perhaps let, you know uh, getting them to buy into the thing that you, you're going to be selling in there. And so that's been a, a really big lesson for me to to kind of, you know, not just trust in my abilities, if that makes sense, um, but understand that there are people who are actually out there who are going to make the decisions on that, um, and you've got to do the work actually way before you walk into the room. The, when you walk into the room, it's actually the final nail that you're doing. So that's just a practical thing that I wanted to share. Uh, and so at this point, um, I'd like to actually invite our panelists to perhaps share a one, uh, tell us of a time or... or, or a story of when you had to actually think very um, practically about you in the game now, you understand that you're in the game. Um, tell us of a time where you were faced with a really big challenge um, in actually influencing or swaying um, a decision. Um, how did you go about doing that? Where did you start? Before, before the answer, can you also maybe, if, tied back to allies and um, networking, like are those some of the tactics that you used? So maybe we can start with Bushle. Yeah, so I, I just want to build on, on, on Zama's example because what you have to realize is that there literally isn't a time where the game does stop. Once you've started it, you are in there. So if you have done the lobbying before, you've, you've had meetings, you've had round robins, and you've got a sense of how it will go in the boardroom, you go into the boardroom and things change. You lose the game by being defeated. You stay in the game by asking questions that say, okay, so, if this was to work in the way that you are saying, how does it work? You keep yourself in the game. A lot of people lose because they get into the boardroom, immediately their idea is not accepted. You, you want to start sulking, you think, oh, this politics, oh, this uh, uh, patriarchy, oh, this uh, boys club. You stay in the game and you ask the questions. The challenge with a lot of people is that you go in there and yes, having done the lobbying, you think yours is the only solution. It isn't, it can't be. There are 10 other people, there are seven other people. So if this doesn't work, what do we all need to do to get it working? In that way, you are still owning the space and you are bringing people to your solution and it becomes a collective solution. That's part of, 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 of the politics of the workplace that you realize that, well, it didn't go well, it's not lost. I can still pick it up and run with it. So my, my advice is don't lose too quickly. So I'll follow up with that. Um, uh, two pieces of advice. First, don't treat work like school. Mm. Work is not school. Yes. Putting your head down, thinking that if you just work really hard, somebody will see how fabulous you are and how wonderful your work is and give you an A 
and magically progress you, big mistake. Work is not school. The task is one thing, the relationships are a completely other thing. And those relationships matter. And then secondly, to understand exactly what people have been saying up until now. What are you there to achieve? And how does your behavior help you and what you're trying to achieve in, the, in your career? And how does it help the organization? If it's all about you, you're a sociopath, if it's all about the organization and what you are trying to achieve doesn't matter, well, you're a martyr. You've got to get it right. You're going to have a limited time, probably, at an organization. What do you want to achieve? How do you use your leverage? Because you always have leverage in a situation. Now, what is it? And how do you show up in a way that gets people to understand that it's absolutely about you, but it's also about the organization? So two pieces of advice that I can give. Yeah, um, um, I think from, from my perspective and, and from what the question that Zama was asking is, is you know, I think when it comes to really critical um, um, conversations or decisions that you require is leave nothing to chance. And I think like Niven says, you might have the best, you know, uh, um, out of pocket solution or the most research solution that you have with yourself. Um, but if you leave it for the moment when you're in the boardroom and you make that presentation and half the people are not in a good mood, you are not going to um, um, get the decision that you want. So don't leave that to chance. And if I, if I use the public sector as, as an example, and, and the system is almost designed to force you to, to interact with a set of stakeholders before you make a presentation to a cabinet and so forth. So if I'm not able to sell a solution to my technical peers, as an example, that I know it's a no-go. You know, there, there is no way that a politician is going to walk into a room um, with a briefing from his um, experts that I've interacted with who don't agree with me and that he's mysteriously going to agree with, with my principal in a meeting. So you do the groundwork, you ensure that you are aligned. And even if you want to force the decision, you need to be able to say to the principal, you know, there are three areas of risk. Um, this stakeholder does not agree with me because this is the downside of what we are recommending and this is what they stand to lose and this is how you could approach the problem. So you have to do the groundwork um, up front. If you leave it to chance and you leave it to the boardroom, more often than not, you know, people are not paying attention um, in boardrooms, they're on their phones or there's something else on their agenda that they're interested in and they just really want to get to that point. So you need to be able to find a moment before then to be able to to get um, into into that conversation, otherwise you you know you are leaving it to chance and 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 you are leaving it um, 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 too late. So for me, it's important network, identify the stakeholders, have the conversations upfront, and understand uh, before going into that that you know what is it that you're going to achieve. And and sometimes you know in the in the dirtiness of politics is being able to understand that if I want this one decision so desperately, I'm going to have to forego two other things. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to come to, to either a board meeting or an expo meeting, my colleague is presenting something else and I recognize that the, the downside of what I may have reservations about in the organization, because you must always act in the best interest of, of the organization, but maybe you also realize that there's nothing to lose here, you let it go because you know what is it that you want on the table and you don't want to create um, you know, a certain mood in the environment before you present what you, you, know, what, what you may be looking for. So, so choose your battles. Um, mm. you, don't, you don't have to get into every battle. You don't have to be confrontational with everybody. You don't have to be, you know, as long as you can demonstrate that you're always acting in the best interest of, of, of the organization that you serve. I would totally to amplify what Macholo says, choosing your battle is such a good piece of advice and I couldn't agree with it more. And the last piece of advice that struck me as people were talking is, it was advice I got given a long time ago and I had to put my ego to one side to listen to it. And it was, if you have to be, if you have to choose, and you don't always have to choose, but if you have to choose between being right and being effective, choose being effective. Right is a relative concept in organizations for all the reasons we've discussed. Effective sends you in much more good, much more stead. Okay, great stuff. Look, we've got 14 questions. The chat is popping. There are lots of questions coming through. I think now let's move over to the Q&A. Um, I'll start with the first question coming from Robin Tekiso. And she asks, how do you enter the in-club? Uh, maybe Bushle. Sorry, I didn't get the question. How do you enter? The in club. 
<laughs> I can tell you, you don't receive a letter of appointment. <laughs> <laughs> My first advice always, the space that you are in, you own that space, become the best, be the go-to person with that space. People will generally attach to excellence. They will attach to effectiveness. So you might not have to do much, but just be so effective, you can't be ignored. So that, that's what I would do. That's what I have done. Don't allow yourself to be ignored. You do that by being effective. Okay. Um, another one that comes out is, how does one get out of the politics and how do you not take things personally when it's human nature? It's been, it's been answered briefly about once you're in, you're in the game, but if, is there ever a time where you want to get out and how, what tips can you give to someone to not take things personally? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would agree with a point that, you know, once you are in, you're in. So when you say you're opting out of corporate politics is, is you opting not to exercise the power that you've been given um, in, in that organization. And I think, you know, when you do take that decision, you do risk, uh, I'm losing value um, in, in, in an organization because essentially you sit out critical conversations and mm -hmm. um, you are just going to exist within an, a, an organization and you don't do what we say saying that in the spaces that you are given, you are the go-to person and that's, that's, you know, that's what you have to offer. So if you decide that you are going to sit back, lay back, you know, it, the, you, you, you know, you do risk having um, somebody else step into your space and, 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 and somehow rendering you reluctant. So that's a re sort of redundant and that's, that's the risk that you take. Ch Chola has a, a really great question here, right? Um, uh, and the question is, and I guess it's around redemption, right? So what happens if you actually weren't playing politics uh, in a given organization? Is there a way that you can actually salvage your role or reputation? Or do you simply have to leave and then go start from scratch in a new organization? I'm sure that's a question actually that resonates with a lot of us. So I think it depends. Um, in my book, the, when I invite you to craft a political strategy, the very first question I, I get you to ask and answer of yourself is, are you in danger of becoming the problem? And the problem in capital letters. And when you are, then people are starting to fantasize about how much easier life would be if you were gone because you're problematic. If you are not becoming the problem though, then you still have an opportunity to, to fix things and to redeem yourself. And even if you're starting to become the problem, you can take a step back from the cliff edge that being the problem gives you. So yes, you can always reinvent yourself or you can always try to reinvent yourself. I mean, companies do it all the time. Sometimes it is too late though, if you've done too much damage. If it's not too late though, it really is about going back to the basics and the basics of the brand that is you. What is the brand that you are trying to project? Bookley said it beautifully. What is the value and the power and the space that you occupy and how might you do it better? But we are all as human beings subject to confirmation bias, right? So we look for confirming evidence of what we've decided to be true. And if people have made a particular judgment around you because of how you've shown up, if they have formed particular impressions of you, it is sometimes going to be impossible to change that. But not always. You can redeem yourself. You can come back but know that it will take concerted effort and work and you better put your back into it. There's one here from Brett Ferreira and he asks, how can your role team or personal be driven forward without offending or rubbing others up the wrong way and being perceived as domineering and a selfish leader? <laughs> Well, Brett, are you sure you're not a selfish leader? But I'm just like, okay, Bukhle, you look like you want to answer that question. No, <laughs> I was just reading, I was just reading something uh, as, as that question came up. And my, my initial thought is, as professionals in any organization, we need to accept that in the same way, 
that we can't like and love anyone, everyone in the organization. That will be the same for us. So there are those people who will not like us. We will rub them the wrong way for whatever reason. And that's part of life. Mm -hmm. If you are staying in your truth, if you are staying in your professionalism and there is, is it's someone's feeling and they can't come to you and talk about it, I honestly wouldn't worry about it. Remember, when you are being effective, you are having impact on processes and people. That's what effective is about. Effective is about how we impact people and how we're using the processes to get what we, we need to get for the organization. In that, people will not like it. And if we can't have an adult conversation about what the challenge is, guys, let's let's move on. It's life. You know, I, 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 I'm laughing because that's that's what it is. So I completely agree with what Mufe is saying. I would yeah. just add to that. It is a mistake to intentionally antagonize other people. Yes, absolutely. Every time you've got one more adversary, one more person who's not invested in your success, because you couldn't be bothered to see their perspective, you couldn't be bothered to try to find some kind of win-win solution. Just know that the risks to you increase. So I completely agree with Buchle. Sometimes we're not going to get on. We don't need to be friends to work together and make things happen. But intentionally antagonizing people because you don't see their importance because they're more junior to you or you don't like them, that's a mistake. Yeah. So this, this is so interesting. Um, um, Niven has actually or is about to publish um, a book um, that actually, I guess, will help us really get deeper as well into some of the practical tools. Um, it's called, If You Don't Do Politics, Politics Will Do You, A Guide to Navigating Office Politics Ethically and Successfully. Um, there's a, a really short paragraph that I just want to read here, and I'd like uh, perhaps the reaction of, of everyone in the room actually on this. Um, I found it quite interesting. She says, one of the most awful stories I heard in one of my lectures was from a woman who was probably in her early 30s. She told us of her very first day and her very first job at a company that every single person reading this book would know. She was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, like many of us, and straight out of university, one of the first people in her family to have a degree in an office job. She was raring to get going and start what she hoped would be a brilliant career of doing amazing things in the world. Five minutes into the meeting, the first manager she had ever had, the words of wisdom and advice he chose to give her in her introduction to the organization and the world of work were, in this place, you either pull up your socks or you pull down your pants. So I thought that was quite... Um, uh, Horrific. I almost want to say... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm trying to find the right word to use, but I'd like uh, I'd like to perhaps uh, invite uh, some reactions on that, right? Um, Niven, when you were writing that, what were your thoughts? Um, and perhaps, Mahola, how do you actually relate to that when you think about your career progression, right? And I guess it goes back to the one question that a lot of people are asking themselves. How do you start? Where do you start, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, look, it, it is a horrific quote, and I remember um, the reaction from everyone in the room when she said this. And the reality is, I mean, you just have to read the most cursory research to see how broken organizations are. The level of disengagement, according to Gallup, is sitting at about 86%, which means most people come to work just hating what they're doing and actively disengaged. There was a piece of research I read the other day that there were over 3,000 people surveyed in the, the US, and 35% of those people said that they would forego, and these mm. are the exact words, a substantial pay raise in return for seeing their immediate manager fired. Wow. There is depression and anxiety and absentee uh, figures that are just going through the roof, and this is not just South Africa, it's all across the world, and it gets worse in an economic downturn like we're having now. Domestic violence is proven to get worse when things are bad economically. So things are broken in many, many ways, which is why I especially say the decision to opt out of politics is a really short-sighted one. The decision not to engage in good politics, 
not just for your sake, but for everyone who counts on you in the organization and in your team is a really bad one. Organizations, teams, people need good managers. They need good leaders. And a core part of being a good manager and a good leader is knowing how to do politics and doing it effectively. Knowing how to do the power, the relationships, the influence and the perception. We need that. You need to do that, not just for your own sake, but for the sake of people who are being treated abysmally in organizations all over the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, mean, I, I think that, that extract is um, somewhat nauseating. Um, mm. Uh, and I suppose it's, it's a reality that um, a, a lot of people do 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 experience, um, and I, I, yeah, and I, I think the 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 what I was saying earlier on about you know winners and losers. Sometimes you have to make a choice about your losses. Um, I think there's a whole conversation to be had about corporate bullying um, um, and yeah. what Niven is saying. There is is a huge um, area that people who who are dressed in suits and fancy dresses every every single day, masquerading as leaders, masquerading as managers, and they come into the office every single day, you know, to bully people by virtue of positions um, that they hold. And you know, you you have people going through all sorts of things, as as, as Niven mentions. And, and I think more often than not, because we want to make uh, more often than not, because we want to make a success of our, our careers, you know, we, we have the, the attitude to want to make it work. We have the attitude of, you know, having to bear with the stress, have to bear with the bullying, have to bear with, um, um, uh, you know, what, what you are being asked to deliver, even though you know it's, it's impossible. And I think the ones about uh, pulling your pants down is probably the, the worst outcome um, um, out of it. And I think, you know, I, I always hope that um, in those moments, in those situations, we can always have the strength to walk away from such situations or to be able to find um, safe spaces to be able to, to have those conversations. And I think as senior leaders, senior women leaders in organizations, we unfortunately carry that added responsibility of creating that safe space for people to be able to walk um, into your office and have this conversation. Because sometimes, um, you know, we also become so entrenched in the inner circle because I've made it into, into the core with the boys that um, I believe every other person must really take the, the, the cat ladder, the, the, the really steep ladder into, 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 into that space and not create uh, a much more uh, um, better route for other, people, for other people to traverse. So I think our responsibility is, 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 is greater um, to be able to create better environments for people who may be looking up to us, who may be struggling through these things um, um, in organization. But you know, I, I, I sincerely do hope that um, at any given point in time, we all have the courage to be able to walk away, particularly from, for situations that are clearly unethical, um, that are just beyond even bullying and you're being asked to do things that are, that are, that are um, just morally wrong. Um, but we do know that um, a, a lot of particularly young women do go through that. Wow, look, we've, we've, we've come to the end of our webinar. I wish we could, we could go on and on and on. It's such an interesting topic. Um, but before, just to close up um, and to leave our attendees with, with something that they can take away, maybe if I could get each, each panelist to just share what you would like people to stop doing, start doing, and continue doing when it comes to corporate politics. Um, maybe let's start with you, Niven. Um, so stop doing, stop telling yourself the single story that politics is negative and if you engage in it, you're a terrible person. Start engaging and understanding more about a much more complex subject that has huge influence in how successful or unsuccessful you're going to be in your career. Um, and change doing, change your language. You know, are you lobbying or are you doing your homework? Are you, um, what, is the, what are the words that you're using? Because the moment you have the language, you have a value judgment around what you're doing. Lobbying has negative connotations. Doing your homework is being prepared. So watch that. Anything to yeah. give our attention? Yeah, you know, I struggle with start, stop, continue. I'll just give a phrase uh, in the way that I, I would want people to, to think. 
um, as, as professionals that wherever we are, we need to accept that we are not less than, we are not more than, we are equal to. We've worked long and hard to be where we are, to start thinking we are less than or we are more than. We are always equal to. And whether it's power you're speaking to, it's a peer you're speaking to, it's somebody that you think is of a lower standing than yourself, never more than, um, never less than, always equal to. Nice. Always equal to. I love that. Mahola? Um, I think I think for me is is I think that the best advice I would give is that um, for professionals, you know, professional expertise alone are not going to get too far. Um, mm -hmm. Be part um, of understanding the environment in which you operate. It is not negative, but it's part of how organizations work, and you need to find um, a way to 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 exercise um, the limited power that you, you you hold in organization because we do all do have power um, and different spheres of influence um, in the organization and um, show up as a best version of yourself. You know, at at, at all times, at, at worst, you'd be criticized for a one percent that you didn't deliver, but bring the best version of yourself at all times. And I think that will put you in a better position um, in terms of um, corporate politics and being relied on as that one person in, in, in an organization. Lovely stuff. Zama, is there any more notes or tips that you'd like to share with our guests? So I've actually um, tried to summarize um, what we've just heard um, on the chat. Uh, I just want to say, guys, thank you so much um, for all the insights that you've given us, for sharing your personal stories. Um, and to all to everybody else in the room, I think it's been really awesome engaging with you all. I agree this deserves a round two. Toela, make it happen. <laughs> I'll make it happen. Um, thank you very much. Um, just also want to say, um, Niven, our ne Niven has got a book that's out. Um, we've put it. We've put the link in the in the chat. So if you'd like to purchase it, um, you can follow that link and you get a twenty percent discount. Bushle is the owner of a company called Career Grow. She Bushle, would you like to share a little about what your company does? Uh, we are about growing people. We facilitate your next level in your career. Uh, we are on um, www.careergrow.co.za. Thank you. And then next week, we've got work-life integration, how to juggle it all. We're speaking to three phenomenal ladies, Lisa Kolwa, Shahida Tungo and Chola O'Brien. So see you next week. Thank you everyone for joining us. Loved the conversation. Took a lot out. Meetings before the meeting, own your space, get into the game, use the right language, be positive, be confident. Don't take things emotionally, have that emotional muscle. And that's how you can play the game successfully and, and ethically and it will actually help you enjoy your career life. So thank you everyone. Thank you for participating in the chat. It was really awesome. Um, can't wait to see you again next week and for round two. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks.